Good morning and welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today is Friday, April 19th, 2024, and you are tuned into the program devoted to reading, hearing, and pondering God's written word, the Holy Scriptures, with a view to proclaiming the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is day two of our great share which affords us the opportunity to share and support this vibrant gospel ministry, now coming on its 100th anniversary in December. Won't you consider sharing and supporting KFUO? This is Pastor David Boyce Clare, Senior Pastor of our Redeemer Lutheran Church, Overland, Missouri, sitting in for our regular host, uh, Pastor Phil Boo, Pastor of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Our thoughts and prayers go out to him and his family at the passing of his mother to the life to come. Today we are continuing our study of the book of Proverbs, chapter 10. Whether you are listening to us over the air on AM 850 in St. Louis or live stream or on demand at KFUO.org or through the KFUO mobile app or maybe as the podcast, I'm glad you're here. So settle in and we are about to begin. Thy Strong Word is graciously brought to you by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF translates, publishes, and distributes books that are Bible-based, Christ-centered, and Reformation-driven. So when you get time, visit them online at lhfmissions.org. That's lhfmissions with an S on the end, dot org. Well, to help us in our continuing study of Proverbs 10 today, we welcome uh, Pastor Dustin Beck of Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Warda, Texas. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, Pastor Boyce Claire. How are you? I'm doing great and uh, just really excited about studying Proverbs today. How about you? Absolutely. Should be a lot of fun. So, um, uh, would you like to begin our our, um, study today with a word of prayer? I think so. Let us pray. We pray you, O Lord, to keep our tongues from evil and our lips from speaking deceit, that as your holy angels continuously sing praises to you in heaven, so may we at all times glorify you on earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We have completed the introductory section of the Proverbs, chapters 1 through 9, in which we are reminded the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. That provides the proper grounding of this collection of wisdom sayings. We might note that there are 31 chapters in Proverbs that might provide a good chapter a day for a 31-day month, wouldn't it be, Pastor? I think so. Yeah, I've, I've, I, that's a, a practice that I'm familiar with. I've heard uh, several folks before who have said that there's, you know, there's 31 days in the month and a longer month, and there's 31 chapters in Proverbs, so it just kind of works out that way. Uh, a couple of the chapters are, um, I don't know, they're, they're interesting uh, as a choice for devotional reading, but uh, the book of Proverbs itself is, um, it's a collection of wisdom, uh, wisdom writings, uh, and it's it's founded basically in the fact, as you mentioned before, that uh, as, as the introduction has it, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So uh, knowing God by faith uh, is the basis, it is the foundation of what true wisdom is all about. Uh, and I think that's what Solomon found out um, early on. Of course, he didn't always listen to his own wisdom. Uh, but uh, within the book of Proverbs, we have this uh, this contrast that's going to build throughout the course of the book. Uh, where we see what the wise person will do, and we see what the fool will do. Uh, so this book is um, uh, it's filled with these these proverbs, these pithy little short sayings, uh, these phrases that have, you know, a wise man will do this, but a foolish man will do that. Um, and so there's always this contrast that's built into it, and we're supposed to kind of read this and, you know, be like that one, not like that one. Uh, just as kind of an invitation to us to to see good examples of what wisdom looks like and to follow through. Yes, and and uh, it's kind of addressed to um, the reader or hearer like a uh, wise son or a foolish yeah. son. So there, it's it's uh, fatherly advice for the young, and, and also another uh, metaphor that's uh, kind of central here, which is of course true for the entire Hebrew culture is uh, that there is the way of life and the way of uh, destruction or the way of folly. 
And, uh, you know, and, and, and that's kind of like when we speak of our Christian life as a Christian walk. And it's rather interesting that some of the literature of uh, the um, uh, scribes, Pharisees, and, and, and the Jews, of course, is called halachic uh, literature, which means uh, literature for the walk of life and, and, and faithfulness to God. As it, it, you, you bought, probably bump into that quite often. We're gonna, one of the Proverbs that we're going to look at today uh, it, it uses that metaphor. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, that's quintessential. That's fundamental to how we uh, experience life is, you know, we're, we're a, a moving people. We're, you know, never stationary. We're always going towards that next thing. We're always pressing on and pressing through. And uh, so as we walk, as we go, what are the things that we are to be about? You know, namely, uh, loving God and lovingly serving our neighbor. Uh, and so, yeah, we'll see some of that today. Love I- I think very helpful is uh, Dr. Andrew Steinman's uh, Concordia commentary that uh, recently came out on Proverbs. Um, he he uh, finds uh, that there is some coherence, some structure to uh, the collection, whereas there are some uh, commentators, of course, that think it's just like a, a random uh, you know, hodgepodge of, of uh, pithy statements and, and, and wise statements. But he, he points out that, um, like, the, in the nature of the Proverbs, uh, there are uh, the, the one uh, form is, of course, uh, two lines uh, the one stating uh, something, and then the second line uh, antithetical to that. And that's kind of the way the Proverbs that are in our selection for today are, are arranged. There, there's also using the what is called Hebrew parallelism, which is quite common in the Psalms, where uh, the uh, holy writer says it says the statement in one way, and then he um, uh, you know, says it in 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 a, just a slightly different way. How blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered? How blessed is the man uh, to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity? And so, you know, you have that type of parallelism. And and the other type is is just not merely saying the same thing in different words, but also building on that. So that that's kind of a helps us kind of understand uh, the type of literature we have. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, Hebrew poetry is such a beautiful thing because you have, uh, like you said, I mean, you have, there are certainly cases where you'll have uh, this, not that. You'll have uh, the cases where you'll have two different ways of speaking of it. And then you'll have kind of the, uh, that last one that you described where you have, we're going to state it and then we're going to state it in an even more over the top kind of a way, you know, for emphasis. Um, Hebrew poetry is, you know, like all poetry, it's going to use um, it's going to use metaphor. It's going to use figurative language. Uh, so as we're going through it, we kind of have to we have to slow down a little bit, uh, especially. I mean, this was I don't know about you, Pastor Boyce Claire, but you know, learning Hebrew uh, in college and then putting it into use in seminary. Um, when we got to sections of poetry, it was always more difficult. It was always okay. What is this saying? What does this mean? What is the image here that's that's being depicted for us? Um, it's it's a little bit of a uh, a challenge, but it's a challenge that's always worthwhile. Yes, a lot of times, uh, you know, when you're translating Hebrew, you, I mean, uh, you have to maybe add a few words. Sometimes in some translations, yeah. uh, they're uh, faithful in pointing that out by uh, putting the added words in italics. Uh, right. I know the New American Standard Bible does does it that mm-hmm. way. Um, and, um, you know, you're, you're trying to get the sense. You get uh, a lot of participles, a lot of different, uh, you know, uh, and then and, and also with Hebrew, uh, you, it's sort of like parataxis. It's all on the same level, uh, this and this and this and this and right. this. So um, have you, in your ministry, made use of the book of Proverbs? Or have you studied in a Bible class or, or in what way would you would you use it? You know what? I'm trying to think. Um, I know that we've we've briefly gone through it. We did uh, at one point. Uh, we did kind of a survey of each book of the Bible, and so we've we've spent some time in Proverbs, but um, not not in the last several years. Um, it, it certainly is useful uh, in terms of uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of truths uh, that are espoused in other places in Scripture that Proverbs uh, helps to sort of. I don't want to say backfill, but it helps to sort of give you just kind of a boiled down, distilled version of 
you know, this big teach, the big long teaching that is found, you know, in a parable of Jesus or, um, you know, in, in, in an Old Testament um, account that we're supposed to, you know, remember this is what the point of this story is. This is what we are supposed to receive from it. Um, a lot of times Proverbs really just, uh, it has a way of serving as a summary for a lot of those things. Um, but yeah, I mean, a, a study of the 31 chapters of Proverbs would be a great Bible study. I think that'd be uh, beneficial for folks who, like you said, they're thinking this is just kind of, you know, a collection of, I don't want to say uh, fortunes from a fortune, you know, fortune cookie kind of just, you know, little slips of paper type deal. It's not that. It is actually composed and it is put together in such a way that you're going to have, you know, themes. We're going to talk about the heart of, uh, of the wise man or of the fool. We're going to talk about the lips here in our, our text today, you know, the words that we say, and that's why we opened with the prayer that we did. Uh, but so we'll, we'll look at these different aspects and they are kind of grouped together in terms of the thematic um, sort of statements that are being made in the larger book. So yeah, I love that idea. Thank you, Pastor. I think this is a time in which we're going to break. Yes, sir. For nearly a hundred years, KFUO has proclaimed faithfully the gospel of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins. Now and for the next 100 years, our mission is the same, proclaiming Christ for you. It's easy to support KFUO. Simply text the letters KFUO to the number 41444 to make a donation. Text KFUO to the number 41444 and make your gift today. KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Welcome back. This is Reverend David Boyce Clare sitting in for Pastor Phil Boo. And uh, with us is our guest, uh, Pastor Dustin Beck from Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Warda, Texas. Uh, we're, we're talking about Proverbs. We're talking about uh, the, this type of literature, which uh, sort of is uh, what you might say the third use of the law, wouldn't you say, Pastor? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This is this is instruction for the for the wise person, instruction for the Christian. I mean, I suppose that it, it's also, um, you know, in, in a sense, it could be a second use of the law, uh, because, I mean, the the person who uh, is being foolish, the person who is um, who is not, uh, you know, abiding in the in the wisdom and the fear of the Lord, um, they probably need to hear uh, the result of their folly. But yeah, no, I, I think that this is uh, for us. This is uh, a beneficial, a useful third use of the law kind of a, uh, kind of a text in front of us today, especially but the whole book of Proverbs too. Yeah, and it, what's rather interesting is uh, Werner Ehlert made a point that uh, you know he was he was faithful to Formula of Concord five and six about which is about the third use of the law and law and gospel and so on. Uh, he said that uh, you can't uh, separate uh, the different functions of the law, uh, like you say. Okay, I want to use the law in the first use today, which is a curb, or the uh, use it as the primary use of it is the mirror or the uh, you know convicting uh, function of the law or and then of course the uh, one that informs the new obedience which is to let us know what God's will for us is but it's always present in all of those uses and and for the sinner of course it always accuses and so we'll see that let's uh, jump into our text uh, we're going to I'm going to take it in uh, sections here uh, we have, uh, it's uh, Proverbs chapter 10, uh, beginning of verse 13. We're going to go from verses 13 to 24. We're going to use the first two uh, verses. On the lips of him who has understanding, wisdom is found, but a rod is for the back of him who lacks sense. The wise lay up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool brings ruin near. 
And and of course, it uh, just just as a, uh, it's kind of reflected in in two other proverbs or two other verses, uh, Proverbs nineteen twenty nine, condemnation is ready for scoffers and beating for the backs of fools, and a whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. Proverbs twenty six verse eight. Any any uh, unpacking of this for us, Pastor? Yes, absolutely. So um, we're going to see this theme of uh, the use of our tongue, whether we're speaking things that are true uh, and that are real, or whether we're speaking things that are false, speaking things that are uh, that are not not based in reality, right? Lies. Um, and so here in these first two verses, uh, it opens up, and as we said, there's there is sort of a pattern. Uh, of the the couplets here, where we have on the lips of him who has understanding, wisdom is found, right? So this understanding here is not just, uh, it's not just an information kind of understanding. Uh, this is talking about the understanding that is knowing the Lord God and trusting in his, uh, his Christ, his Messiah. Okay, so um, when we're in this situation, uh, we experience uh, what, what, you know, Solomon refers to here as wisdom, um, and then, you know, laying up knowledge. What do we lay up knowledge for? We lay up knowledge for the future. We lay up knowledge so that we don't have to be afraid uh, whenever bad things happen or, or this, that, or the other thing. So there's these, you know, the, the plus side. Um, I think in the notes that I sent over to you, I had uh, the, the the positive things highlighted in one color, and I had the negative ones highlighted in another. That's more just so I can keep it straight in my own head. But uh, you've got this back and forth that's going on here, where you know um, wisdom is found in the one who whose lips, whose whose speech, right, is reflected of this understanding. Uh, and again, you're, you're talking about you know as we go along the way and having sort of in our minds. Uh, the the wisdom for the journey, uh, but also here, uh, you know, in Deuteronomy six, uh, the great Shema, when it's talking about you know, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It isn't just talking about as you go, but it's talking about as you go, and then when you get down, uh, lay down, and when you get up, and when you're at the table, and everywhere else, speak about these things, right? And so this is really uh, the emphasis is clearly placed upon the um, the type of talk. That God's people would engage in, uh, that we would engage not in uh, in hiding things, in deception, uh, but instead that we would just uh, use our words to proclaim the the word of God, use our words to uh, to demonstrate that knowledge and that wisdom. But yeah, then as we mentioned, the other side, a rod is for the back of him who lacks sense, right? So this deals with the um, the final outcome, the eventual outcome of the fool. Um, the kind of fool who says in their heart there is no God or the kind of fool who says in his heart, you know, I can do whatever I want and God isn't going to come after me. Uh, ruin comes near to that type of a fool. So, and again, they base this, uh, Solomon bases this in the mouth of that fool. So it's it's all about the, the things that we say. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about the things that are in our heart as well. But those are my just initial thoughts on these first couple of verses. Yes, and and I want to thank you for uh, conveying to me uh, your your notes. They've been very helpful for me uh, <laughs> sitting in, and and uh, I, I thought that I thought they were from someone else, but uh, but I really appreciated them. They're very insightful and 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 very helpful. Uh, Luther uh, wrote in the Large Catechism: Children are best trained with kind. Oh, you you have that in your in your notes there. <laughs> children are sure. best trained with kindness and delight. For children who must be forced with rods and blows will not develop into a good generation, and and so that 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 ultimately is uh, the situation where um, the um, uh, where where it's you don't want to raise children or even have people in society kind of governed by um, whips or chains or, or whatever or, or incarceration uh, or you know in in the way the law is in its first use uh, you yeah. know you you have to if you train people in righteousness then they, then they're not going to um, depart from it. Well, and isn't this a fascinating thing though? Um, is to say that. You know, God has created us. He's created mankind in his image, in his likeness. I mean, part of being in the image and likeness of God, even though we, we have fallen from that, that 
complete, you know, completely pure and sinless in uh, image and likeness of God. Part of that is that we have cre- we have been created to be the pinnacle of creation. We have a reason, a reasoning spirit. We have uh, a soul. We have the ability to worship and the ability to uh, to choose the right and everything else like that. Uh, at least in terms of our our lives uh, lived here in creation. But what we what we find, and this is this is so fascinating, what we find is that to abandon the way of God um, is actually to be kind of like a beast, right? Um, and so uh, you find this throughout the Old Testament that uh, not only uh, when when the people engage in idolatry do they become like the idols, they become deaf and mute and dumb and everything else, uh, but you find that there's there's also violence associated with that, right? Violence is not uh, part of God's good ordered creation. Violence is what comes with the fall. And so when we embrace you know, I mean, and and I don't, I don't know about you, Pastor Boyce Claire. I mean, we've, we've done a little bit of spanking. It's, it's not usually our first go-to in parenting. Um, I'm feeling like I'm on trial here now. Ugh. No, just kidding. Uh, but you know, children are. I think we could agree they are best trained with kindness and delight. Right? Reason with a child. Um, train up a child in the way that he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. Um, but those who must be forced with rods and blows. I mean, y- you've got a problem there. And the problem is, is that you're communicating with, with these. And this is, by the way, this is not me or Martin Luther or you know the you know the uh, the author here, Solomon. This is not any of us saying you know you're wrong or you're bad or evil if you spank your kids. Um, there are plenty of other reasons why we could say that we are all wrong and bad and evil and in need of a savior. We should confess those things. But the point I think is made here is, you know, that when we engage in this this violent animalistic behavior, uh, there is a real problem. Okay, Um, and so we are called uh, throughout the book of Proverbs. And remember, this is Solomon's words to his hopefully wise son. Right. Um, Which when you think about who comes after Solomon, Rehoboam, uh, yeah, the 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 wisdom was was not with that one. Anyways, that's another conversation for another day. When we look at this and we see that, you know, we raise up our children unto wisdom. Yeah, that, that's that is the goal. I think that's every parent's goal um, is we want our kids to be wise. We want our kids to have understanding um, and not just to be the ones that always fear to spanking. Yeah. Is that, and, is that where you were going with that? Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. But although, uh, see, these are proverbs. So spare the rod yeah. and spoil the child. Right. Or, oh, but, right there. There you go. <laughs> uh, so anyway, let's um, let's go on to the next uh, verse. Uh, where where it kind of uh, goes away from um, what is spoken to um, what one possesses. Uh, And it may be a different type of proverb in in verses uh, 15 and 16. A rich man's wealth is his strong city. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. The wage of the righteous leads to life, the gain of the wicked to sin. By the way, these are these Uh, We're reading from the English Standard Version of of the Scriptures. Um, um, What's rather interesting is is in order to understand this perhaps a little better, um, I looked at the um, King James Version translation of of this. Uh, The rich man's wealth is is his strong city. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. It kind of made me help me understand what it says. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. Um, you know what? What would you see uh, Solomon saying in that phrase? The poverty of the poor is their ruin. Sure, sure. So I I, I actually think that um, that verses fifteen and sixteen they really need to be read together. Um, and and so I, I don't want to just pull this, you know, like I said, just pull one verse out of the the whole mix. Uh, but we're talking about the poverty of the poor being their ruin. Um, this, I think, what he's getting at here is the fact that there are those there are those ways where um, you know we can almost we can get so down on ourselves, down in our luck, down on our, our circumstances, right? That that is sort of what, um, what takes precedence. That's what, uh, is, is the most in clearly in focus thing in front of us is to say, you know, woe is me. You know, I, I would, everything would be great if it were this way, but 
you know, everything is, is not this way. And, you know, the, the little guy can never get ahead and all this kind of stuff. And we feel sorry for ourselves, right? Um, the Lutheran Study Bible has a helpful note on verse 16. It says that wealth can be a blessing from God for the righteous and can strengthen their ability to serve God's purposes, right? So uh, the Bible is never, never angry at wealth. The problem is not having wealth. The problem is when wealth has you, Right. Um, and so it's not the, the 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 money is the root of all kinds of evil. You know, Paul says to Timothy, but it's the love of money. That's the problem uh, is when our love, uh, our fear, love and trust, as the catechism teaches, that is supposed to go towards God is instead going towards, you know, mammon stuff, you know, security that we have right here um, on Earth. And so I think that, you know, um, it, it's often kind of understood that, you know, it's. You know, there are there are good rich people and there are bad rich people. And at the same time, there are good poor people and there are bad poor people. It's not the richness or the poorness that makes you one or the other. Um, it's actually something on a deeper level here. Uh, and verse 16 points out the wage of the righteous leads to life. Um, and so when we're thinking of riches, when we're thinking of not having riches, right? So the the uh, the one, uh, the righteous one um, is going to experience the, the good wage. He's going to experience the, um, the, the being built up and having this strong city around him, not necessarily a, a literal city, uh, but that he has, you know, uh, the Lord's protection around him. He's got the Lord's favor upon him. Uh, but I think that uh, at least that's, that's the way that I understood it. Am, are, are we on the same page with that one? Or, or? Oh, absolutely. I think okay. at this time, uh, we're going to have to uh, take another exciting break oh, for our share Jesus Christ is risen. It's the good news all the world needs to hear, and you can help deliver the message. The Lutheran Heritage Foundation is dedicated to translating and printing the good books of our Lutheran faith so that all nations may know the love of Christ. In more than 140 languages, LHF provides Bible storybooks, small catechisms, devotion books, and more that proclaim the Easter message. Learn how you can help at lhfmissions.org. Welcome back. Uh, we are uh, we are back uh, for our study of uh, Proverbs ten. This is Pastor David Boisclair and Pastor Dustin Beck, and and we we were looking at uh, uh, verses fifteen and sixteen. A rich man's wealth is his strong city. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. The wage of the righteous leads to life. The gain of the wicked to sin. Uh, one one thing I wanted to note is there is another proverb that says that uh, where where the uh, the righteous man says do not give me uh, don't make me poor or too poor so that I go out and steal and and dishonor the name of God and and do not make me too wealthy so that I don't say who is the Lord that's kind of like uh, as you, as you had pointed out there are good uh, rich people and there are uh, bad rich people. There are good poor people, and there are bad poor people. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and, and well, and then the other thing is is that uh, the you know whether a person is rich or poor. It, it's a question. If if I have wealth, then uh, you know, for those of course who worship Mammon, which is the special idol uh, of the wealthy, that uh, they um, uh, that. Wealth or money is everything to them. Is 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 life is is all powerful, and, and even the poor, if they don't have money, uh, they think that they're lost. They have nothing. Yeah, and I, I think that there's there's also you know sometimes when uh, when you read through a couple of verses of scripture and it just kind of uh, it, it makes a little red flag or a little antenna somewhere back here 
kind of stand up a little bit. Uh, my mind, when I was reading through uh, verses 15 and 16, uh, took me to uh, both Matthew 13 and Matthew 25, when Jesus says, to the one who has more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So there, there's this, you know, if, if you've got the right, the right faith in God, you know, and things start to take place good in your life, right? I mean, you're going to have that, that overabundance, that cup running over joy uh, and fullness. Um, but if you don't, right, then, I mean, if you, if you experience that, that kind of a poverty of spirit in which you don't have uh, faith in Christ, well, then, I mean, even, even the, you know, the happiness and the joy that you have in this life um, is fleeting. So, I don't know. That was just a, a thing that I had thought of when we were when we were preparing for the text. I think it's very, uh, very important. OK, let's uh, uh, tread on here um, in our in the way of righteousness. Uh, verse 17, whoever heeds instruction is on the path to life, but he who rejects reproof leads others astray. And, and, and it reminds me of uh, the scripture passage from 2 Timothy 3. Uh, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So um, maybe uh, give your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, verse 17 here um, is an interesting, uh, interesting verse because I think it really leads into the next couple of verses uh, where we see kind of a change up of the pattern. Uh, but the, the, the overarching kind of idea here um, is, you know, are you teachable? Right. That's a that's a quality that we look for um, as, you know, as, as teachers or as pastors or as, you know, uh, uh, little league coaches, things like that. Um, I'm not a little league coach, but, you know, folks will look for somebody who is teachable, who is coachable, um, because, you know, the the coachable kid, um, they don't necessarily have a ceiling. They can they can, you know, learn from their mistakes. They can learn from their shortcomings and learn how to overcome things. Uh, but, you know, the talented kid uh, or, or person, you know, uh, uh, who has um, a ceiling because they reject reproof, they reject correction. Um, that is a problem in and of itself. And I mean, it's the same problem, you know, right now uh, in the three year lectionary, we're going through uh, our epistles are from First John. And in First John 1, we have that section that comes out in uh, Divine Services 1 and 2 in the Lutheran Service book uh, and the exhortation for confession. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And that's what's being talked about here is if we go around acting like we are um, uh, above being corrected, if we, you know, are not capable of erring, you know, um, well, then first of all, we're lying to ourselves. We're not walking in the truth. Uh, and then the next uh, couple of verses go on to say that we're even making a liar out of God because God has, has revealed to us, you know, that, that whoever sins, you know, is, is guilty of death and is in need of saving, et cetera, so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, it's a real danger uh, to reject reproof. We should always be open to, you know, if, if we say something, you know, either here on the, on the air or, you know, from a pulpit on Sunday morning, or even just in our conversation, uh, if we've stepped out of bounds, then we ought to be, um, we ought to be more than, uh, more than gracious, uh, to, to step aside from that pride and to say, you know, you know, uh, I didn't, I didn't express that clearly, or maybe I was, I was off base on that. Please forgive me. Um, yeah, gotta be open to correction. So, um, you know, I noticed in, in, uh, uh, Proverbs nine, uh, they have the, um, they kind of contrast a scoffer from the wise man in nine seven. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, and he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not repro- uh, reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Improve, or rather, reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. So very, very important um, a truth that's being taught by this proverb. It's worth revisiting. So let's go on. Uh, ver- uh, verse 18 of Proverbs 10. The one who conceals hatred has lying lips, and whoever utters slander is a fool. 
Um, this is kind of, I think, an on, uh, a um, exhortation to be honest with people, not to be two-faced or hip- hypocritical toward them. Uh, you know, in, in other words, if if you really have a problem with someone, uh, you know, you don't sugarcoat it. Uh, you probably try to, you know, uh, reason with them or, or whatever, or, or you know, not not pretend that everything is fine. Uh, is that how you read that? Well, that that's certainly that's a part of it, right? Trying to uh, to just uh, kind of smooth things over when things are not smooth at all. Uh, trying to put forward a pretense. Uh, we might uh, we might express it that way. Uh, but I really I think that this grows out of that verse 17, that second half, the one who rejects reproof, because what do we do? You know, imagine, you know, uh, uh, listeners, use your imagination and think of, you know, uh, what would it be like if someone rejects reproof is, is beyond being corrected? Right. Um, well, they're trying to conceal something. Because they know in their heart of hearts that they're wrong. They know that they're, you know, uh, that they've stepped outside of the truth. Well, how do you how do you conceal that? How do you hide, you know, uh, and and kind of put on the uh, the false pretense of no, no, no. I don't. I, you're the one who's wrong. It's it's not me. Well, um, you tell lies about it, okay? Uh, or maybe uh, you tell lies about your neighbor, right? And that's the second part of verse eighteen: utters slander. Okay, so all of this is just kind of, uh, this is intensifying that second section there of verse uh, 17. Uh, and it's, it is interesting to note uh, that we have uh, these couple of verses where the pattern is a little bit more broken up, right? We had the good do this or the, the wise do this, but the fool does that. Uh, and now we've got verse 18 that is, you know, all about what the, the foolish person does. Uh, he conceals hatred. He has lying lips. Um, and then the one who utters slander is a fool. So I almost think that that's, um, you know, just as you did back in, uh, in chapter nine, just a moment ago, you know, there's this expanded section that talks about why the wise person would actually like to be corrected. I'd like to not make that mistake again, or at least have, you know, your instruction, your help along the way to avoid it in the future. Uh, but the fool is going to, I mean, we, we always kind of call this um, around here, at least in our family, we call it doubling down. Right. You want to double down on the poor decision that you made. Uh, You want to really just lean into that to say, no, 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 no. You know, I'm I'm not the one who's out of touch. Clearly, it's it's everyone else. So, yeah, it's a scary thing. Yeah, and it shows. I guess it shows the importance of uh, reading things in context, and then and, and maybe this is a demonstration, as Doctor Steinman says in his commentary, that uh, there is a connection. Uh, they're not just dis- disjointed. Uh, um, Proverbs that are sort of uh, put uh, together with each other. So we uh, go on uh, to um, uh, verses 19 through 21. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is of little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. I, I remember uh, that uh, my teachers in grade school used to say, "Talk is cheap," uh, mm-hmm. and and there was a uh, my parents had a had a little sign of maxims uh, in their uh, family room that said, "To be noticed, stand up; to be heard, speak up; to be respected, shut up." So what is that kind of uh, an idea that we have there? I think so. I think so. Uh, and again, I, I think that this just this transitions out of those last two verses beautifully uh, because that's sort of the last bit of the uh, the playbook of the one who's rejecting reproof um, is to cover up their own shame, you know, with many words, whether it's excuses, whether it's, you know, um, you know, just waxing eloquent. I mean, we've we've probably all seen. Uh, you know, uh, seen uh, videos of, of folks doing, you know, Christian apologetics, or maybe we've, you know, engaged in such things. Uh, but when the when the person that you're talking back to or talking with uh, there has, you know, just, um, you know, a, a deluge of words, you know, and they're just going to not let you get a word in edgewise. Well, I mean, that's, yeah, that's not a loving thing. That's not a good thing. That's not a kind thing. Um, and in fact, I mean, it's, it's foolish. Right. So, uh, yeah, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. The more you say, uh, the, the better the chances that you're going to wind up, um, 
you know, sticking your foot in a, in a, um, a noose or a, a trap or something like that. Uh, our words can get us into trouble. It's a good thing to restrain our lips. Uh, I once uh, knew a pastor who I asked him about it one time because he, a man I greatly respected, and he was, he was always very quiet at, uh, you know, at district events or, at, you know, conventions, you know, synodical or, or otherwise. Um, and I asked him one time, I said, you have all the right you know, ideas and everything like that, but you never really seem to speak up. And he kind of responded back and he said, there's a lot of people that like to hear their own voices. You know, I try to only throw mine in whenever I think that it's the right time and no one else is going to say it. And I thought there was some wisdom in that. Maybe he got that from Proverbs. <laughs> yeah. At this point, uh, we're, we're going to take another break for our share Sounds good. For nearly a hundred years, KFUO has proclaimed faithfully the gospel of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins. Now and for the next 100 years, our mission is the same, proclaiming Christ for you. It's easy to support KFUO. Simply text the letters KFUO to the number 41444 to make a donation. Text KFUO to the number 41444 and make your gift today. KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Welcome back. Uh, this is Pastor David Boyceclair with Pastor Dustin Beck, uh, looking at uh, Proverbs chapter 10, verses 13 to 24. Uh, we talked about um, the importance of um, curbing the tongue. I, I'm kind of one one passage of scripture that really deals with this, and, and one pa- uh, book in the New Testament, which is very much like Proverbs, is the letter of uh, the general letter of of Saint James, and uh, he has in chapter three. Uh, you know, he 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 writes in James three two. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his own whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well, and and so on. And And then he mentions... So also the tongue, this is verse 5, is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. I'm sort of reminded, uh, like in um, um, in one of the Elizabethan plays, where uh, we're told danger is in words. And, and words can be very hurtful as well. And, and of course, words can be... Um, useless and vain as as uh, the proverb tells us but um, it, it's important for us to learn how to govern our tongue yes sir absolutely absolutely because uh, what we come to find is that the the tongue is going to actually um, it's going to be the uh, the means by which we communicate what's in the heart right uh, and so uh, when he says you know here that uh, the tongue of the righteous is choice silver, but you contrast that with the heart of the wicked is of little worth. Okay. So, you know, he's not just, you know, comparing body parts or things like that. I mean, I think you could, we could also agree that the heart of the righteous is choice silver um, and that the tongue of the wicked is of little worth, but the tongue is, is the means by which we communicate that which is in our hearts. You know, remember uh, Romans 10, 9, uh, where it says that, you know, if you believe in your heart, uh, you know, and confess with your mouth uh, that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Uh, because with the heart one believes, uh, and with the mouth one confesses and is justified. So these two things go together. And, um, yeah, you're going you're gonna to see, uh, uh, see the heart of the righteous one, uh, by the truth that he or she speaks. Um, and truth is valuable. 
You know, uh, we, you said uh, you said earlier when we were talking about uh, many were or when words are many, transgression is not lacking. You you had said you had the sign, you know, at your parents' house is that talk is cheap, you know, all this kind of stuff. Or we had talked about you know talk is cheap, and you know if you want to be thought wise, then then shut up and all that, right? But uh, here, you know, the the tongue of the righteous, when you speak truth, right? Specifically, when you speak the word of the Lord, um, that is of great value. That is. Uh, you're describing the way that things really are, and you're talking about the way that God has created them and has recreated them in Christ. Um, everything else is of the devil. Everything else is a lie. Um, and so, yeah, you can see why it's absolutely worthless and just not the kinds of things that we want to fill our hearts uh, or our minds with. I like uh, one version of uh, St. Patrick's breastplate where they say, Christ um, in in mouth of all who see me, uh, you know, Christ in in my in rising Christ in speaking Christ in working Christ in in sleeping, uh, you know it, it's it in, in other words or is as the Lord says that it should be gracious our our communication should be gracious seasoned with salt, and and uh, that's that's very important for us to remember as Christians. Absolutely, got to make it count. <laughs> so, well, we have uh, have uh, about three more verses to look through. Uh, verse uh, 22, the blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. I, I'm going to kind of single that one out uh, because um, it, it kind of gives us a proper understanding of, of maybe um, – uh, when we should be, uh, you know, energetic in 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 uh, pulling our own weight a weight in life, or or that we're prosperous because we work hard or something like right. that. Uh, I think that that this puts a proper uh, understanding of that. And and as the one of the um, uh, commentators that uh, has said that this is uh, you know encapsulated in Psalm 127 verses one through two. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for He gives His to His beloved sleep. And so, in other words, it's it's the blessing of the Lord, not uh, not human uh, endeavor. Yeah, we receive all things from the Lord's gracious hand. I mean, everything that we receive in this life is from God. Um, and so, you know, yeah, putting things in that proper perspective, uh, you know, the blessing of the Lord, of Yahweh, makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. God is going to give us the things that, that he is going to give when and where he chooses, uh, and we get to say amen. That's that's the wise response to it is, you know, um, amen. Or, you know, in the, in the case of Job, who received many blessings from God, and then everything is taken away, he says, um, you know, uh, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, and I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's not an easy thing to say. Sometimes it's not a fun thing to say, but it is a wise thing to say. Uh, it is a, a wise thing to to have faith in God uh, that He gives us these these gifts, these blessings. You know, uh, uh, even things like our health, right? He gives us these things for a time, for a season, um, and then there will be a time when those things are not with us anymore. Yeah, so I know I, I'm seeing two minutes up on the up on the the camera there. So we got to get we got to get moving through this, right? Absolutely. Uh, the so, final verses are: Doing wrong is like a joke to a fool, but wisdom is pleasure to a man of understanding. What the wicked yeah. dreads will come upon him, but the desire of the righteous will be granted. Yeah, so this is a great way to a great way for the last couple of minutes to end our study today because uh, you really see this. Um, this is what the results are going to look like, at least what the results look like in this life. Okay, um, verse twenty-three, uh, because you've met those folks who you know. Um, wrongdoing is something that they rejoice in. Wrongdoing is something that brings them, you know, that joy and that that jovial nature. Uh, but the person who is wise and the type of wisdom that Solomon is hoping to uh, bestow upon his son, I mean, this is the wisdom of knowing God. Uh, that is what brings us pleasure and joy, right? So, uh, and then to finish it out, yeah, uh, wicked dreads will come upon that one, uh, but instead the desire of the righteous will be granted. So where will it all wind up? It'll all wind up, and God's going to sort it out, uh, the wise, uh, you know, unto eternal life, those who have faith, and those who don't, um, not. 
And, was and, that brief um, enough? <laughs> I, I, I think it is. And um, I, I want to thank uh, my, my brother, Pastor Dustin Beck from Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Warda, Texas. Uh, this sure. is uh, David Boyce Clare, pastor of uh, our Redeemer Lutheran Church in Overland, Missouri, uh, wishing that may God's peace and blessing be with all of you as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.